got my Tesla shirt on today. What up guys, welcome to another episode of HyperChange. Today I wanna to do a recap and analysis of Tesla's earnings call that happened this Wednesday. Um, listened to the call, took a bunch of notes, my hands are tired of typing. So now I wanna make this video kind of breaking down each part of the call and what I thought about it. The only thing in the prepared remarks is that the CFO, Jason Wheeler, who was there for since 2015 is leaving. It was interesting, I thought on the call, that Wheeler made a point to say he loves Tesla more than ever right now. What is he going to leave to do? Public policy. And if you read the press release, which I'm going to link to in the video description, that Tesla actually put out surrounding his departure, he says he wants to continue the mission of sustainable transport in public policy and advocate. It could actually be a really smart strategic move to have Wheeler leave and go work in the private sector as an ally for Tesla. I could, they couldn't have found a better replacement for Wheeler at the same time. Uh, Deepak Ahuja, or Aju I don't know. Anyway, we'll call him Deepak. Um, he was their CFO from 2008 to 2015, did an incredible job, but now he's come back full time, was asked on the call, yes, he will be permanent. Kind of an interesting way to start the call. Elon was a little bit too happy that his old CFO was leaving for me to think that there's not going to be some good happen when he hits the public office and he's going to help out Tesla. We'll see. TBD on that. They start the Q&A. First question from Adam Jonas, who's my favorite Tesla analyst. I think he gets the story really well. He's always ahead of the curve in announcing things like Tesla mobility, Model 3 sales. Anyways, real smart dude, follow his research. But he starts out with like this question about Mars that just, I don't know, confused me and is basically like, oh, well, the Trump administration says they might like do a mission to send humans to Mars. If they do, does that mean you need to spend more time with SpaceX to accomplish that mission? And if that were to happen, would it make more sense to merge Tesla and SpaceX into one company? So it's, yeah, I, I'm like, they, I, I'm not cool enough to get on the Tesla call. They won't let me ask a question to get in the queue, but they're letting bankers ask this crap. So I don't know what's going on with that. Anyway, Elon kind of brushed it off, was like, I'm committed to Tesla. I'm going to work for them forever. But I thought that was a funny question. Elon added, he's been working at SpaceX and Tesla for years now. He's in a good rhythm. I think it's working well. Um, so that's just going to continue. Jonas's next question is actually a lot more pertinent and interesting. And he's saying, okay, so it looks like based on preliminary autopilot data that your cars are now 90% safer than every other car on the road due to these new features you've implemented. Yet insurance companies are only offering a 5% discount to insure them. Would you consider launching your own Tesla insurance product? The answer was yes. We've already been doing this quietly. So they're trying to package in a maintenance and insurance program that they're going to sell to customers through their stores. Super easy turnkey solution. So Tesla's actually getting into the automotive insurance industry because they're reducing the crash rates so much with their autopilot software that it makes sense for them to disrupt the auto insurance industry too and come up with their own models because the current like legacy uh, insurance companies aren't adjusting fast enough to how much safer Tesla's vehicles are. Yada, yada, yada. They say they're going to come out, have a really cool uh, combined offering of maintenance and insurance. Insurance isn't going to become a big piece of their business, I don't think, but it's interesting to see them offer it as an easy solution. I think makes it a competitive advantage for people who want to buy the cars. Goldman comes on the line next. What are you going to do differently in terms of building the Model 3 versus the S and X? The Model 3 was de designed for manufacturing cost simplicity from the ground up. They've been thinking about this. They're taking all the learnings from the Model S and X. They even noted how like the X was such a headache that they learned so much from it and they're putting all that knowledge to use in the Model 3. So it's not going to have the Falcon Wing doors. It doesn't have the door handles that pop out. You actually have to press them manually. So these small differences for the lower cost car are going to make it much simpler to produce. It can't be understated the fact that Tesla is learning faster than every car company right now. And another interesting point was for Model S and X, they weren't even getting A teams from A suppliers. For Model 3, they're going to get A teams from A suppliers. People thought they were going to go bankrupt, so no one wanted to work with them when they were only selling the S and X. In fact, Elon points out like some fancy schmancy industry auto data source said they would only sell 3,000 units of the Model S in the car's entire lifetime. So all the suppliers are only looking at that data, ignoring what Tesla's saying, and therefore they assume Tesla was going to go bankrupt instantly. Why even talk to them? Because they're not going to be a big money supplier. Now they're looking at the data. They've seen that Tesla is now selling a run rate of 50,000 Model S per year, blowing away those numbers, disrupting the whole industry. Everybody wants to work with Tesla. I would if I was an auto supplier. So now they're getting A teams at A executives. So the whole supply chain is just way more grown up and mature. Combine that with the fact they're producing a much simpler car. And I think it starts to click of why the Model 3 ramp is going to happen so much exponentially faster. They have the Gigafactory now. That's also a big different part of the production. They're building batteries, powertrain, um, other stuff in-house. So I think that's going to make it cheaper, potentially a faster turnaround. 
JP Morgan asks about what happened with the delay in autopilot. Why was there a delay in the rollout? Apparently, when Tesla ended its relationship with Mobileye, Mobileye got pissed, of course, because Tesla was going up to use their own software. So Tesla's original plan, which honestly doesn't make sense since they screwed over Mobileye, was to test out Mobileye software and Tesla Vision and make it kind of like a smooth transition into Tesla Vision. Unsurprisingly, Mobileye wasn't down with that, screw them over, They got Mobileye got rid of their software instantly, they had to go full force with Tesla Vision. In the long run, it won't matter because they're gonna build out their own system without Mobileye, but Mobileye pulled this one last power move. They, they had a bunch of additional testing before rolling out the new autopilot features based solely on Tesla Vision because they wanted to be 100% sure it was safe. Elon said he's already been testing it himself for three months at high speeds and it works fine. Quick note, I, that, that's why I love Elon Musk. Like he's the first guy to try his own products. He's the first guy to like, when the Tesla built their supercharger network across the country, he was the first guy to be like, yep, I'm taking my family on a road trip to, from LA to New York with no emissions, all on superchargers for free to show you guys how epic it is. Love that about him. Keep doing that, Elon. So then JP Morgan asked a question about uh, the cash burn of the solar business. The, the most important thing happening with Tesla's solar business that they brought up is they're really strategic, this was in the letter too, they're really strategically shifting to not leasing anymore, but actually selling systems outright. It looks like the percentage of systems they're selling first leasing is like getting flipped on its head. That was a lot of the problem with the solar city models. They were locked in these 20 year leases. People were expected to pay for 20 years. It was based on these super far out cash flows. Nobody liked that. Upfront sales is the way to go and it's just gonna keep getting cheaper and cheaper. And I think with the solar roof product, we're gonna meld into you know, the majority of the sales being like outright, like people would buy a normal roof. Cool to see the progress on that already happening, even though we're so early in the acquisition. RBC Capital Markets, why did you get guidance for only the first half of the year? Is Are you expecting some like decrease in demand for the Model S and X as the Model 3 rolls out? Maybe, but that's not really it, is what Elon said. Basically, his line of thinking is, Production is going to be so exponential towards the back half of the year of the Model 3 that they're not comfortable guiding a number yet because they don't have enough granularity. I think that's smart. I'm not looking into it too much. Why not be conservative? For once, right? <laughs> they were asking Elon about whether the workers would unionize. He doesn't expect them to. If you take into account Tesla's equity compensation, its employees are some of the highest paid in the auto industry. I think that's true. He also mentions that the uh, like injury rate on the job is less than half of the auto industry average. So all these complaints about people not being paid enough, getting hurt on the job, when he actually dove into the numbers were BS, so he doesn't think they're gonna unionize. We'll see what happens. Bank of America asks, with Scott Pruitt as the new head of the EPA, he could remove all these ZEV regulations. What's What do you think is gonna happen? Elon's response was interesting, which is, if they remove the incentives from the uh, sustainable transport industry, he thinks they'll remove incentives from the fossil fuel industry as well. It'll be a net net. Regardless, Tesla's not re relying on the ZEV credits at all. I don't know why anyone cares so much about these credits. They're not driving Tesla's sales. Tesla's not making money on them. Actually, the other big automakers are. Elon has said numerous times that removing the ZEV credits would actually be a net positive for Tesla. I'm in the same boat. I think people ask way too many questions about the Zev credits. It's like half the conference call every time. Screw it. Like, it doesn't matter. Let's focus on the core business and what Tesla's actually building instead of some BS regulation that goes away when they make a couple hundred thousand cars anyway. I'm invested in Tesla for when they make millions of units per year, right? Like, I think that's why everybody is. Stop wasting our time on the conference call asking about two million difference in Zev credit, you know? Like, anyway, rant's over. Can you talk about the order growth for the Model 3? Last official number you gave us is 400,000 units. Where are we at now? Of course they're not giving you an update. Basically what they said is like, we don't like we don't even want to talk about the Model 3 because all we would focus on is building it. We're not even trying to sell it. We're not trying to increase the backlog. Demand is through the charts. Like this is pretty obvious, Bank of America. I don't, I mean, they still asked it. Funny because all these analysts are like, oh, what is demand? Okay, Tesla nerds put out a website that I've linked to in one of my old episodes. I'm gonna link to it again in this one. It's called model3counter.com. They have like this built this algorithm. That I think it's at, like 525,000 right now. I, based on like the 400,000 a while ago, steady buildup, it honestly seems to hit the nail on the head for me. So I'm taking the liberty to guess based on model3counter.com that there's a backlog of about 500,000 Model 3 on the books. And that lines up pretty reasonably with their production targets. So, you know, the guesswork of 400,000 backlog a while ago, production targets of 500,000 per year for 2018, I think that's around where the backlog is now.
UBS starts to ask about gross margin on the Model 3. Will it be profitable from day one or will it take time to ramp? Basically, Elon was like, okay, dude, of course it's not gonna be profitable from day one. The first car is gonna be super unprofitable. But as we hit that first like capacity jump of 5,000 units per week, then we can see gross margins similar to Model S and X. So there you go, that's your answer. Gross margins of the Model 3 are gonna suck until they get volume of at least 250,000 units annually. So then you'd be asked, that's a funny question, like, so next year you're going to get to 5,000 Model 3 units per week? Elon's like, eh, I think we're actually going to do that this year, which was in the quarterly letter, so I don't know why they would have asked next. Anyway, he's like, look, we're telling suppliers in July we're going to need 1,000 parts per month, or enough parts to make 1,000 cars per month. In August, we're going to need enough parts to make 2,000 cars per month. And then in September, it's going to be 4,000 cars per month. So that's what they're telling their suppliers. But at the same time, he knows that some suppliers are going to mess up. He called it, like, the term paper phenomena. No matter what happens, when you set the deadline, some kids in the class are going to turn their assignment late. That's why even though they like are 100% planning to start production in July, you have to assume that that actually won't be when production really starts because there's always going to be these like unexpected part delays, which, you know, is totally normal and expected and understandable. I don't know why people are freaking out about it, but like there's this whole misconception of like is the Model 3 going to be late? Are they going to deliver it late and that'll be tragic? And it's like, "No." I don't think so. There's a backlog. People are dying for it. Whether they deliver the first one July 1st or August 1st, I don't think is really going to make any difference in the long run. So that's why all this, or even like October 1st, I don't think will make a difference in the long run. The Model 3 is coming. They're going to wait to build it until they get it perfect. And I don't think the wait list is going to drop off if it's a month or two late. I don't, that's why I'm so confused about all this analysis of like, oh, well, what if the Model 3 is late? So what? I guarantee you, like, less than 10% of the people who are in line are going to drop the reservation if it's even a year late. That's total guess, but whatever. Any color on cash burn? This was a really interesting question. Um, he's because in May 2016 was when Tesla raised its last capital. They said they would never have to raise more money for the Model 3. This is the part of the conference call that has got Wall Street up in arms, as always. Tesla is going to go back to the capital markets, or that's what Elon said, to raise more money to fund the Model 3. But his answer is very interesting. What he's saying is that technically, according to our like fiscal plan or roadmap, we will never have to raise money for the Model 3. because But we're going to cut it really close. Like We're going to invest all these billions. We're going to get almost down to $0 left in the bank. But right when we hit $0 left in the bank, then all the money is going to start rolling in for Model 3 sales. So we technically won't need to raise money. But I don't think it's a smart idea to cut it so close. So to reduce the risk on our shareholders, we may raise money. We will probably raise money. All the bears. This is why the stock's down. This is why everybody's freaking out. I don't think it's a big deal at all. Look, they're building a car company from the ground up, from scratch. They need a fleet of robots to build a million cars. That costs billions of dollars. And so they're going to the capital markets to raise money. I think they've raised money really effectively each time. Tesla's earnings power per share and revenue per share continue to grow. That's why I don't care about dilution. Like even if uh, Tesla were to raise two and a half billion to get like more as a cushion, which I think may be a smart idea at today's prices, that's only five to 6% of the market cap. So I'm only looking at five to 6% dilution when the company is setting up to build 500,000 units in 2018. That's up from 76,000 units in 2016. So they're going like seven to eight fold X production in two years and everyone's complaining about a five or 6% share count dilution totally worth it to me. Like I want them to dilute because I want that safety. They're probably going to do another capital raise. Does it matter? Does it worry me as a shareholder? Not at all. I actually think it's a smart idea and I will sleep a little bit better at night knowing they're not planning on cutting it to like zero dollars in the bank. Like give yourself a little cushion, Elon. Why not? And he said he will. So I think they're going to raise capital. And I think once that headache is lifted over the stock, people are going to start to get really stoked. And I'm getting a little off track, but I think 2017 is a real transition year for Tesla. Like they're they're building out all this infrastructure. They're like they're they're going from full startup to like profitable real automaker. Like they're coming in this last coming of age teenager moment and it's real hard and it's going to be tough, but when they get out of the other side in 2018 and they productions at 5 to 10,000 Model 3 per week, like the solar roof tile is out. They figured out how to manage solar city and integrate it. Like we're going to be through the other side. And I think this is going to be an incredibly profitable company. Barclays asked some question about payment terms to suppliers. Not really a big deal. Basically what's happening is because they're earning more trust with their suppliers, they're able to push out 
the time needed to pay them for the parts. This is good because it helps them manage their cash position like with more flexibility. You know, just standard things that happen when you grow up as a company. Some analyst that I couldn't figure out who, what his name was asked, is the, is the final Model 3 gonna look the same as the Beta Model 3 they showed in the unveiling? Elon's answer was pretty much yes. And then he was like, wait, we might make a couple tweaks and the tweaks that we do make are gonna make it look way better. Um, but there was a couple questions about debt. T Tesla's able to take out loans for the equipment it has in its factory. So the more equipment it has, the more loans it can take out. So what they're saying is as they build out their infrastructure, they're able to pull some of that value ahead by borrowing against it. Minor nuance, but still cool to know that Tesla gets more cash flexibility and banks are giving them more liquidity as they see them building out this infrastructure. Robert Baird, uh, some analysts from them, answer, asked a really good question. So you, Elon, you've said you wanted to build 500,000 units in 2018. Um, and a million a year by 2020, are we still on track for that? This is what everyone's waiting for, drum roll. Classic Elon fashion kind of gives a roundabout answer at first, basically giving all these kilowatt hour numbers of battery packs, saying that the Gigafactory will be able to produce a million cars per year and 30 kilowatt hours of energy storage, which sounds like a lot of energy storage business. Too. Then he follows up by saying, in terms of the way he looks at it now, in Elon's head, the most likely scenario is them delivering half a million cars in 2018 and scaling that to a million cars by 2020. Still on track, still on target, love to hear it. Analysts asked about when configurations start for the Model 3. Uh, should be in about three to four months. Another interesting tidbit is that he said employees are gonna be getting the first cars. This is so that they can let the employees test them out, get feedback, get that feedback loop rolling so that before customers actually receive the product, people have already played around with it. They worked out the kinks. Unknown analyst asked about a solar securitization occurring in Q4, none in Q4, but they said one and happened in Q1. Doherty comes in with a very interesting question, which is, okay, so it looks like you're gonna be able to build a million cars a year with the Gigafactory one, but you announced in the quarterly letter uh, that just came out with this call, Gigafactories 3, 4, and 5. Gigafactory number 2 is the building they already own in Buffalo, New York that builds the solar city panels that they got through the acquisition. So they have the Gigafactory 1, Nevada, where they're building Model 3 batteries, Big Gigafactory 2, Buffalo, New York, where they're building the solar cells, but they've announced like preliminary plans for 3, 4, and 5 in the letter so that the analyst is like, okay, what's up with that? What's going on? Like, how many million cars are we building? Elon's answer for this, he's like, well, we want to keep some powder dry for announcements later in the year. So basically what he's saying is we won't tell you what those gigafactories are for. We're going to announce that later in the year and it's really exciting stuff. And we had enough news, Tesla news to digest today anyway. So I'm just going to keep your clip, uh, cliffhanger on that one. Thought that's cool. I'm really looking forward to figure out what they're going to do with all these extra gigafactories. Tesla thinks they need to build more gigafactories. That means they think they're going to be selling a lot, lot more of something, which means a lot more revenue and a lot more earnings if they're right. So definitely something to keep track of. Deutsche Bank asked a clarifying question about the CapEx number. They guided that they need 2 to $2.5 in CapEx to fund uh, production or launch of the Model 3. So to clarify that, um, the analyst asked, okay, so does that mean that you're going to spend all that in just the first half of the year? Answer is yes. Deutsche Bank went a little deeper into the CapEx situation um, and trying to understand if the ramp from 5,000 units to 10,000 units would require as much as the ramp from zero to 5,000. The answer is no. It should be about 50% of the CapEx requirement to go from five to 10,000 as it did from zero to 5,000. In a worst case, it could be 70% of the CapEx. These are just some numbers that Elon threw out to ballpark it. A lot of the investment is up front, and then as they scale, the gross margin will steadily improve. This part I really liked. Deutsche Bank goes, okay, so I'm trying to think about the automotive business from a cash flow perspective. At 250,000 units annually, would you be cash flow positive? Elon's answer is, we could be if we weren't going to be scaling to a million units when we hit 250,000. And then he goes on to follow up and say, we're already at a 10 billion run rate right now. That's two and a half billion in gross profit about, and he thinks we would be prof cash flow positive and profitable if we weren't building the company out like crazy. This is really important. This is exactly like what Jeff Bezos did with Amazon. He is investing at a breakneck pace to capture every opportunity, not stopping to make a profit. He doesn't give a crap about this year's profit. They're thinking about profit 10 years from now, not the earnings this year, earnings power from 10 years from now. And to build that up as quickly as possible, they need to be investing at the future. They need to be investing like there's no tomorrow. That's exactly what, or I guess they need to be investing like there's a 10 year, 10 year, 10 years worth of tomorrows. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I think a lot of skeptics are just going to sweep that under the rug and say that's BS, but I actually believe Elon. And I think that if you look at the numbers from Q3, they prove that they could be profitable. So I think this company is 
ultra profitable on a per unit basis, you're not seeing that because they're expanding so quickly and investing in becoming 10 times bigger that no one is appreciating how profitable Tesla is looking on a per unit basis already. And that is gonna be so promising down the line when they're delivering 500, a million cars and they're still keeping that ultra high level of profitability at the unit level. Those expenses get spread out among their whole retail operations. And I think we see Tesla becoming the world's most profitable car company on an operating margin perspective perspective. I've been saying this from day one, but I think it's finally coming to fruition and it was great to hear it on the conference call from Elon himself to say that, look, we could be profitable. We could be cash flow positive. We're not. It's on purpose because we're getting 10 times bigger. Love it. Oh yeah. Elon actually asked for feedback on that part. Hey, do you think we should slow down and make a profit or like invest in cash? I don't know if the analysts are giving feedback. I'm giving you feedback, Elon. That is an epic idea. As a Tesla shareholder, screw everybody else. Let's go balls to the wall. The Model 3 is in demand. You got 500,000 people drooling to drive it, including me, even though I'm too broke to put down a reservation. You should be building this stuff as fast as possible. The world can't wait another day to not have sustainable transport. That's number one. Two, as a Tesla shareholder, I can't wait till we're pumping out half a million Model 3s per year because that's why I'm invested in the company. So if we can get to a sustainable world faster and we could have more Model 3s on the road, which means higher earnings for Tesla, let's invest. Screw earnings this year, Elon. Screw Wall Street. Screw what they say to do. Invest for the long term. I love what Tesla is doing. Sum it up, uh, kind of, you know, not too much a surprise in the quarter because they already announced their delivery numbers. I'll link to my video um, that I did projecting how many units Tesla will deliver in 2017. My guess was 110,000. I'm sticking with that given they guided for 47 to 50,000 in the first half. I think I'm kind of in the ballpark and I like being conservative because I think Tesla always like they get a little too excited, but you know, can't blame them. Most important things from the call that I thought were Solar City is going from not leasing anymore to a direct sales model and loan model. That is going to be way better in the long run. I think that's really smart. It turns Solar City from being a piece of crap to actually maybe a business one day. That's a necessary move. The other thing is Model 3, they're on track to deliver 500,000 units of, or I guess they're on track to deliver 500,000 total units of SX and 3 in 2018. I'm not investing for deliveries in 2017. Forget about it. I'm investing for deliveries in 2018, 19, 20, 25. And it looks like Tesla is exactly on track. They're on track to get that million dollar unit delivery number in 2020. The bull thesis is intact. The brand is stronger than ever. They're integrating Solar City. That's going to reduce the customer acquisition cost of that whole business. It's going to make their Tesla retail stores have twice as much to sell. Now you can't just buy, you don't have to just buy a car. You can buy your battery. You can buy your solar panels. Like the vision is coming together in 2017. This year is going to be a year of a lot of hard groundwork, getting the Model 3 out, produced, delivered, working, production at scale. Once it's done, at the end of 2017, I think Tesla is going to be totally transformed. We're going to have a company that's doing 20, 25, 30 billion in revenue annually. They're going to be profitable. They're going to be pumping out cash unless they have something way better to invest in, which I hope they discover. Oh, one more thing on the Gigafactories. Moonshot. I want to close the episode with a moonshot. I think the reason why they're already planning to build different gigafactories is it's possible that they're setting up for the Tesla network. This Think about it. 500,000 people want to buy the Model 3 and they've guided, as I put in my uh, video that I put out a couple days ago, the Tesla network, they've said they will build their own fleet of robot taxis to operate in cities where there's not enough Tesla owners running out their vehicles. So they're setting up to build their own fleet of a robot taxi network. I think that's why they're building, already planning more gigafactories is because they know, look, we are already selling half a million car cars per year of the Model 3 without our robot taxi service. If we have a robot taxi service too, we're gonna need another million. Let's start building that now because the demand for that is gonna be in three to four years. That's how long it takes to build a gigafactory. I love that not only are they stopping at gigafactory one, we've already got up to gigafactory five planned. Uh, ambitious as ever, great quarter. Hope you guys enjoyed the wrap up. Comments, questions, feedback, subscribe if you haven't already. See you guys next time. This is HyperChange. Big fan of the Tesla apparel. High quality. I've had this shirt for a while. If you guys want to send me another one, I won't complain.